Cases in hospital remained below 500 for a second day in a row at 498, while 116 are in ICU. NEFID member Dr Mary Favier says the downward trend shows people's sacrifices are having an impact. While there's still a bit of a slog in it, I think we will get there. And there's great positivity in that. And there's, with vaccination coming in, I think there's a good news story. And I think we can see this light at the end of the tunnel and it is coming closer. Meanwhile, the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine could be approved for use in the EU as early as next week. The European Medicines Agency has convened a meeting for March 11th to consider the vaccine. It comes as the Health Minister says Ireland's on track to pass half a million vaccinations administered this week. Stephen Donnelly says Johnson & Johnson could play a big part. It's uh, under consideration at the moment. We all hope that it's approved. And when it's approved, the EMA issues very technical guidance to our own experts here they look at that uh, and then they determine, uh, th well, they provide advice on the best way to use it. In the north, outdoor gatherings at homes and a return to places of worship are among the first measures to be considered as part of its new roadmap out of lockdown. The five-tier plan was agreed by the executive earlier, but it is not date-specific. The staggered approach will instead depend on a range of evidence and begin with what's described as cautious first steps. The economic benefit of hosting the 2030 World Cup far outweighs the cost involved, according to the tourism industry. The government's examining the feasibility of jointly bidding to host the tournament with the UK. It's looking at which stadia would be capable of hosting matches and how much it will be needed to invest in infrastructure. And finally, six Dr Seuss books will no longer be published because of racist and insensitive imagery. The business that preserves the author's legacy says the stories portray people in ways that are hurtful and wrong. Dr Seuss Enterprises says it wants the catalogue to represent and support all families. It's two minutes past nine. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For our most competitive van insurance, go to the AA.ie. Mainly dry overnight with lowest temperatures of minus one to plus three degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball. With Paddy Power. Champions League nights on Off the Ball. Bigger than Zlatan's ego. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie. I prepared to edit my cash. Do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Second half is getting underway very shortly at the Etihad, where it's Manchester City 1, Wolves 0. Man City dominant in this game, but only an own goal to show for it and Donker putting the ball into his own net, but Man City in complete control thus far. Second half about to get underway. Later on in the show, we'll talk to Mark Lawrenson. He's going to pay tribute to Ian St. John, who sadly passed away. In the meantime, Dan McDonnell of the Irish Independent is with us. Good evening. Evening, Joe. World Cup 2030. Here we go. This is the one, Dan. This is the one. I can feel it. Can you... Why are you excited about this? <laughs> but, like... <laughs> But why, why is anyone excited about this? Like this story has been around since September 2018. We need to ask ourselves why why is this why is this a story now? What's happening? Good night, everyone. That was the football show. We'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> Tom Dunn's on the way. <laughs> I'm just saying, like it's, it, I feel like you know people are sort of trapped in some kind of deja vu where they're like. I feel like I've heard about this before, you know. But but all of a sudden, Boris is saying it. And Michal Martin is saying it. And even, like, I watched the, the TV news tonight there. And it looks like every uh, every leader, every political leader at the plinth today outside the, the doll was asked about the World Cup bid, which is a story that clearly has just broken in Leinster House, whereas everyone else has been dealing with this for, like, a long period of time. Like, Jonathan Hill only spoke last Friday about the World Cup bid and what was going on with that. Um... But, but clearly the fact that the, the UK government have said that they're going to... So Boris has told the Sun that they're going to support this feasibility study. The feasibility study that was launched two years ago and was supported by Theresa May at the time, as was reported at the time. But this is now suddenly... This is the story of the day. There's nothing else going on. Nothing else to see here, Joe. Everything <laughs> else is going absolutely fine. Let's talk about the World Cup because what the people need is a good news story to distract them from, from real life. Because that's clearly what's going on here. Because I, I saw this alert last night. I was off. I saw 
stories about Ireland to bid for the work. I was like, oh, they they progressed the study on to formalising the fact that they've launched a bid. And it's like, no, no, they haven't. They've just they're just putting some money towards the study. But hey, it's been analysed all day, everywhere and anywhere, Joe. So let's bring it on. World Cup 2030. What's going to happen? Are they going to bring it to Turl? You know, bring it to Tipperary. Bring it to fucking you know Cork. Wherever else we're going to go. No. You're, you're such a non-GAA person. You were about to <laughs> you were about to say Thurless and then just thought, I'm not quite sure, so I'll go with Tipperary. <laughs> That's what happened there, my friend. And we all spotted it. So don't think we didn't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna deny. I'm gonna I'm gonna Dave Jones you, Jamie Redknapp, and say, take a breath. Take a breath. Take a I'm, breath. I'm pretty relaxed about the whole thing, I have to say. <laughs> Take a breath and listen to uh, the Minister of State for Sport, Jack Chambers. He was on News Talk Breakfast this morning with Shane Coleman. Very excited. We had an announcement from Prime Minister Johnson yesterday on the UK British government uh, positively embracing this. Um, and what, what's being worked through now across the five uh, football associations, the five nations who represent football on the two islands and the Irish government is is working through the feasibility of this. Uh, we want to embrace this in a really positive uh, way. I think it, it, it's a great opportunity in terms of tourism and, and economic benefits uh, if if we embrace this. And it, it, we are at an early stage. It's just important to say that as well. Um, so the, a, a bid will be submitted between 2022 and 2024 when FIFA uh, open the, the bidding process. But I think it, it represents a huge opportunity for, the, for our two islands uh, to present our credentials uh, to the to the globe and also from a footballing okay. perspective. Well, what what would we be talking about in terms of the number of games and where those games would take place? Yeah, so that that's what's being worked through now, uh, Shane, in, in the whole feasibility process. So the whole, obviously, the stadia, the infrastructure demands, uh, the tourism benefit, and the whole economic uh, basis for for such a bid. Okay, and um, I so accept it's early days yet, but it's likely. Yeah. To, is it likely to just be Aviva and Croke Park? Is that the most likely outcome? I wouldn't say that. No, I, like I mean, if you look at the when as part of the Rugby World Cup bid, we had other stadia, and I think there's also it's also important we have a regional component to any such bid. Um, so, so what, I'm what saying, stadium? I'll, I'll, I mean, I know we have Parky Cueve that's fifty thousand, but uh, is more than half of it? I think is is uh, terracing, uh, which will not do for a World Cup. Well, th- that's something that officials in my own department, uh, work, working with the FAI, we, we will obviously try and maximise. Uh, the regional benefit and and try and give try and ensure that uh, the various stadia that are throughout the country, as you've, you've mentioned, Cork and Limerick, also the North South dimension is important. So uh, and we've uh, we've the football association in the North involved as well. And um, so that what what are, what's being worked through now as part of the feasibility process is to is to put formalise what stadia will be involved, the infrastructure demands, and the whole economic. Okay, uh, and how much is a bid going to cost us? That has yet to be worked out, Shane, and that would be that would be that's that's all. As I said, that's part of the the feasibility process that's underway, and and the collaboration that's ongoing now between the two respective governments and the football associations uh, will will work through that. And when that's formalised, when a bid is submitted, as I said it's between twenty twenty two and twenty twenty four when such a bid is, is submitted. But as as you know, we have a huge footballing family. We're a huge sporting nation, yeah. uh, and I think the Irish people expect us to put our best foot forward and also from a tourism perspective uh, that we that we actually uh, we look at the tourism and economic benefits it's one of the biggest okay. events in the world uh, and i think the fact that we've well, two we, islands we'd have we'd have maybe scale. what would we have a few group games and a quarter final maybe like it, there wouldn't be that big a tourism uh, bonus from that would there oh i want to hear the answer <laughs> yeah you, you don't need to hear it to be honest i mean i've heard all the other answers but tells you all to know um, I mean, like, I love that. Like, this is at a very early stage. There, it's an early stage for these, gov- you know, for our government, certainly. Um, but it's been going on for three years. Lest we forget, Joe, do we remember one of the great, the great, what, what would you say is the greatest modern announcement of Irish football recent times? I, I'm going to preempt you on this and say it was the announcement of John Delaney's title as uh, Executive Vice President of the FAI. <laughs> was there a greater moment? Can we remember what John Delaney's job spec was for Executive Vice President? Do you remember what it was? Because I'll tell you what it was. One key part of it was dealing with the very important Euro 2020 tournament and World Cup 2030 bid. Like, this was one of John Delaney's jobs back in, yeah. uh, from the, the Jonathan Hall report, um, the, you know, in Gibraltar, how would we ever forget it back in whenever that was, years ago now. But anyway, like the World Cup was on the horizon then. I distinctly remember months later, 
um, being at, it was the last time I think it was out of the country, uh, your wife in Bucharest when John Delaney had, was gone. And uh, there was a meeting there between the five associations chatting about it. And, and just listening to, to Jack Chambers there, um, I, I think, did I hear you say earlier, he wouldn't come on the show in, in, in general. It's been a while since we've been trying to get him on. But like listening to it there, I'm sort of wondering, like, uh, do, you, do you know what's actually been happening with this process so far? Going on about Cork and Limerick and all this stuff. Like, from what I gather, the early discussions were very much only about the Aviva and Croke Park, because they're the only two that would, that would meet the criteria in any way. Um, you know, you need a 40,000 capacity stadium, all seated, you know, to, to host a group game. You need 60,000 or bigger to have a quarterfinal onwards. So the Aviva is actually out of it. So you need Croke Park. And basically the big problem they have with the bid is there's no suitable stadium in Northern Ireland at all. The Rinza Park has already been done and that won't be up to it. And the new Casement Park, uh, notwithstanding sort of political aspects with that, that will also fall short of it. Um, so, you know, you would need FIFA to provide a substantial, uh, need to, FIFA would need to bend their own rules to allow that to happen, to allow any of those other stadiums in without unbelievable expense and work. Um, and that's not necessarily a great sell when you're competing against other bids that won't have any of those issues. So now, in fairness, I do think that the people who are, have been involved in this bid for some time are aware of all that and have been working off the basis primarily of the Aviva and Croke Park being the only two realistic shows in town. So a lot of the other stuff and the chat around it today, to be frank, has been absolute and utter garbage. <laughs> Including that segment you played there. Going with the football and family and all this, absolute. And in fairness to Jack Chambers, I think actually he's been, you know, been quite good on some stuff recently around sort of providing reassurance for football. And I think the FAI would be conscious of, um, you know, they've built a strong relationship with with government um, with regard to, let's be honest, a, a bailout effectively of Irish football. And I think that the government has been quite helpful to the FAI. Uh, so maybe the FAI just has to sit back and 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 listen to this politics. You know, and, li and listen to this, Michal Martin getting doorstep today, you know, uh, almost out of breath, dealing with this great positive news that the country has been, this is very exciting, that the feasibility study launched in 2018, the news is it's still a feasibility study, <laughs> but Boris is going to put some more money towards this feasibility study. So listen, let's all dream. Let's all dream about what can happen. Meanwhile, what's actually been going on in the real world is that there's, and I've been, this has been a discussion in the last couple of weeks, is that a real problem that the, 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 the bid, which has been moved for some time, is going to face, is that when you, within UEFA, there's thought to be a, quite a degree of support um, for Spain, uh, the Spain-Portugal bid. So in, to pick it in football, you know, football parlance, you know, they've got a job to get out of their group um, if they decide to go through with the bid, never mind actually, you know, win the tournament itself. So... Let's just not get carried away here. But, I mean, it's too late. It's the political story of the day. So who are we to question it? Oof. OK. Uh, anything else on that you want to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what about the, the Samba boys in... Uh, what about the Samba boys in the Central Stadium? What about that? Wouldn't, what a lift that would be for the morale of the country. You know, um, what about, you know, what about fixing some of our problems in football in, con in the country here first, rather than this big picture, you know, stuff. Now, to be fair, listen, the government have probably stepped forward and helped Irish football a bit in recent times, uh, you know, in times of need. So I don't think you can necessarily uh, be as down on them as you might have been in the, in the past in that regard. Mm -hmm. But like this, 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 like getting excited by World Cup bids and, and major tournament bids. It's the type of stuff that people, people love this stuff, you know? People get into this stuff, but but really there's no substance to what they're talking about in the last 24 hours. There's, there really hasn't been any development at all. And as I said, they've a real effort to do. Like, like I mean, we have to be conscious that like a, a British-led bid in Europe presents some complications at the moment when you're trying to get Europe on board with you. Mm. And it's Brexit Britain at the front of the bus saying, come with us rather than the Spain-Portugal bid, you know? And so, like, th there's a couple of problems with this. Like, there'd be five nations trying to compete. Uh, they wouldn't all get the, barring, like, a dramatic change in policy, all five wouldn't automatically qualify. Contrary to what you might hear people say, this is a great way to qualify for the World Cup. That actually hasn't been established. So, I um, mean, Canada are hosting 2026 and still don't know if they're in the competition yet. So, 
There's a lot of issues. Right. A lot of issues. So what you're saying effectively is <laughs> this feasibility study dates back to 2018. Theresa May September, yeah. had signed off on it. Had the Irish government signed off on it as well? The, the government have always indicated they've been positive towards it. I don't think... I'm trying to... I'm tr I don't recall a publicity blitz like this, mm. but certainly, um, you know, the, the world changed a bit in, 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 in an FEI context in 2019. But, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't recall any negative noises around it, certainly, you know. Um, it's been actually around okay. and tipping away for so long. Certainly, okay. but certainly, listen, like did, did, did this, all, all, all that our lot have done today is follow the lead of what Boris said, and Boris is the second prime minister to support the feasibility study. You know, so um, it's it's. Well, it's I would, it's, that's it's interesting because I didn't quite understand where all this had come from. So I know that the UK government are having their budget on Wednesday, and as part of that, Boris Johnson says. It's the right time for the UK and the Republic of Ireland to launch a joint bid to host the 2030 World Cup, I'm reading here. Uh, the UK government will pledge 2.8 million sterling to kickstart the process in Wednesday's budget. So you're saying this process is already underway, but they're kickstarting the process is the way it's been presented to everybody. And Boris said, it's the home of football, it's the right time, it's time for football to come home. And everybody's got... Uh, pretty excited here, but Theresa May had already signed off. And it yeah, Theresa May, were, I'm actually just trying to get the, the actual quotes up, um, but I, I don't quite have them in front of me, but certainly September 2018, yeah, it's 29th of September, The Guardian, uh, Theresa May backs joint UK and Ireland bid to host 2030 right, World okay. Cup. So this, um, I mean, this really is an especially cynical, let's just shape the news cycle of a Tuesday. 100%, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. And listen, I mean, you would say it's so transparent that you know people shouldn't fall for it, but hey, look, it's it's been everywhere all day, as though this hasn't happened before. It's amazing, really. Uh, it's how it works, you know. But like, I mean, as I said, like, I mean, uh, like Jonathan Hill spoke on this topic at length last Friday, um, and spoke actually very well, probably way more significant um, than anything that happened yesterday. Was Jonathan Hill, the new FAI CEO, speaking about it last Friday in real detailed terms, speaking about how. Um, the, 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 the two English bids had floundered in the past and how possibly they had learned from that and realised that like adding some Irish accents into it and an Irish flavour might help. And he said significantly, you know, particularly at UEFA level. And that's important because this bid has a battle to win to get UEFA support. Well, so we're, we're, a like very, we're a very charming people. The listeners are loving the cut of your jib this evening, by the way. Well, that's, that's good to hear, Joe. Loving, loving it. Christ, Dan is right. I thought this myself. Good news will defeat the bad news. Somebody else. Seriously, Joe, we really do get what we vote for. Vacuous claptrap. Paul says, this is a Dan McDonald tour de force. Take that, Chambers. Your boys took one hell of a beating this evening. I'll uh, take that. Dan, you'll be laughing on the other side of your face when we're all heading to our Moor Park to see Ghana versus <laughs> the Netherlands on a sunny Friday <laughs> evening. Says, no. And you know what, Dan? You bloody will and all. But, I'll, but be playing know, this, like, I'll be playing this back to you in 2030. But, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think the bid's a complete no-hoper, right? I'm just saying that, like, a lot of the problems that the bid is, is going to face have already been sort of, you know, the associations are aware of them and I think have been speaking about them and have embraced, you know, and are, are conscious of it. You know, and, and I, I don't think it's complete, it's, the idea is a complete long shot, but just some of the stuff people are talking about, they're taking it around the country and all this stuff, that's, it's not realistic if the bid is going to take off what, and go anywhere. What about, you know, so. what, what about if we build a new 60, 70,000 seater stadium in Leash? Well, I mean, listen, maybe we should. Like, you know, what, is, the, is the Barack Obama Plaza near there? Like, yeah, is there anything well, we, give or take. Can we, get, can, we, can we get Biden involved with this? You know, because he's obviously one of our own yeah, at this stage. I'm sure. I'm sure the next time we get to go to the White House for uh, St. Patrick's Day, you know, we can we can get something out about that. And, you know, we, you can read it. You can read all about it. Um, you know, the, the political story of the year, Ireland bidding for World Cup. Yeah. I mean, what else? What else could be going on at the moment? So. <laughs> I mean, OK. The English spent yeah. 23. <laughs> the English spent 23. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not feeling your enthusiasm here, Joe. Well, I, I just I, I don't know how to feel about all this. The English spent 23 million on their Prince William David Beckham led bid in 
I guess it would have been 2016 territory for Ru what became Russia 2018. So I mean, these these bid processes cost a lot of money. 23 million just to get into the the final four, where they finished dead last. They got two votes yeah. out of 22. Now they will spin that as well. We were the only bloody ones not bribing everyone. So I mean, like we played by the rules. But either way, they finished last, and they're going again. There's going to be a joint bid from Chile, Argentina, Paraguay, and of course Uruguay, the centenary of the mm. first World Cup. As you mentioned, Spain and Portugal are looking to get together. Morocco are in the mix as well, and I'm sure there'll be somewhere else further afield. Uh, 2026, the World Cup has gone from 32 teams to 48, we should remind people. So there are going yeah. to be 80, 80 matches. Hence, after banning joint bids after 2002 and Japan and Korea, we're now allowing joint bids again. So for 2026, when we get this Qatar business out of the way, we'll have USA, Canada and Mexico. As you said, there's still a few issues up in the air there. But in effect, uh, 10 game, ten stadiums US, three in Mexico, three in Canada for the 2026 World Cup. So so joint bids are back. You know, that's kind of the, oh, yeah. the situation in a big way. Uh, does it... OK, parking the cynicism... Uh, sorry, it's not It's not actually cynicism. If it, if it turns out that a feasibility study was launched in 2018, and all that's happened today is they've announced there's still a feasibility study. And they're uh, putting more money behind this. Yeah, OK, well, exactly. so yeah. more, more money is something. Like, let's be fair, more money is something. 2.8 million. Get some architects. Yeah. Get some architects to draw plans. Stuff you know? like that, yeah. And, and Boris is excited. So, look, there's a degree of, well, we're serious about this today. Maybe they've overstretched themselves slightly, but there's a degree of seriousness about this. Parking the, the, the nauseating PR that's going to go with this thing over the next year, and it will be tough to take at times. Is it something we should be going for? Is this a good thing for Ireland to do? Does the cost-benefit ratio of hosting a World Cup uh, make sense? Uh, should any and all money which would go towards this be spent on the grassroots, and uh, we should have nothing to do with this World Cup business, and FIFA can make their five billion another way? What is your take on that? Yeah, see, I, I'm not convinced ultimately. Like, I mean, you know, it, it is a reality, and like people will say, well, this is just like typical moaning, but it is true. Like, it's 2021. You know, you have uh, like we have we have top division clubs in our country uh, doing GoFundMe's to get you know Porto lose sort of put on their ground to restart football, and yet we are talking about you know that's the Finn Harps one who you cannot get a stadium built in Donegal, you know, for for years, and yet you know we're talking about sort of committing funds towards uh, 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 you know a World Cup bid. And as I said, listen, government have been quite supportive around Daily Man Park and other projects. So I'm not just making this an anti, you know, state sort of, you know, attack on them. But I'm just saying that, like, we have a lot of other things to get our house in order with. And the extent to which, um, you know, a World Cup delivers, like, a land of milk and honey to us is disputed. We have a good example of this. Take the pandemic out of it, right? But we have the Euros this summer. Um, and if we were meant to have it last summer, and if Ireland hadn't qualified, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you know, having Poland, Slovakia and Sweden play a Euros here, even with full stadiums, like, what, what does this do for us? Like, if you have automatic, you know, the right to... Ireland will definitely be in it. You can imagine that would give a great boost to the game at all levels. Um, you know, and commercially, there's great opportunities for football to profit around it, you know, which can go into the game. And you can spin the angle for that. And, of course, people will say about, you know, tourism, value to the exchequer. Someone will get a calculator out, mm. multiply hotel rooms by a number of people and come out with, like, you know, four billion or something to the economy, right? But, like, the, the fact is that, you know, so with the you, Euros... Are you, are you saying we make four billion? <laughs> well, so you'll find someone to say no, that I know, probably I know, you can yeah. in a press release. But but the point the point is that like we had the Europa League final here, which was a great event uh, in theory. But do you remember it? It was Porto against Braga. Like I don't know if that like I think with a World Cup and you're talking in many cases about group stage games. Mm -hmm. Like you know, well, would they, there's, sorry, there's a lucky sorry, tip sorry, aspect in it. No, sorry. You know? to, yes, no, totally. And sorry to interrupt. Actually, I, I'm, I was going to ask you a question, but I just want to go to the Etihad because there has been a go. Let's go to Adam Jury. Man City won, Wolves won. How about this for a turn up for the books? Connor Cody has equalised for the visitors. It came about from a free kick whipped in by Matinho. The Man City defenders didn't pick up Cody. He went in for a diving header, made the contact, and Edison couldn't quite reach the ball as it pinged into the bottom right corner of the net. Game on, Man City won, Wolves won. There we are. Interesting. Connor Cody, good man. Uh, Darren Lovely says that the World Cup Irish government non-announcement, he's taking your lead here, Dan, reminded me of the scene in the thick of it when they called a press conference to say there's actually no news, but we're all doing our jobs and it's business as usual. 
I went through the tick. I went through the tick of it back catalog at the start of the pandemic, and uh, I hadn't watched it before to my shame. But uh, yeah, the, the, oh, the, top, top. The, the, the more the more time you spend around and with, with sort of the overlap with you know the FEI unraveling, and, and the more time you get to spend around the doll and Leinster House and all of that. Yeah. you know, a couple of those committee <laughs> hearings and stuff. I mean, I, I struggle to figure out where satire ends and realism begins. The problem know? with the thick of it is your language goes through the dog, you know, goes to the dogs if you're watching it too much. But uh, um, Owen Murphy, uh, sort of, not fully, gets to the point I was going to put to you. He says, Ireland hosting a World Cup is the only way we're going to qualify for one, and maybe if we build a white water rafting facility in Dublin, we can host the Olympics too. Uh, on the first point, if we host World Cup matches in Dublin, and it will only be in Dublin, and actually... I think uh, FIFA and UEFA are set against having multiple games in one city. They don't want, you know, four sets of fans. They generally just want two sets of fans to take over yeah. the city. But, I mean, that's all to be figured out. But regardless, regardless, uh, w would we not be talking then about a World Cup match involving Ireland? Group stages are no, it doesn't really matter to me. And that would be kind of cool. Now, I'm not saying it's worth all the money. In Only the... if Ireland qualify. But would, would we not qualify as part of this joint no, bid? No, it's not guaranteed. There's 48 no. teams. Doesn't matter. We couldn't so even you, do it. 48 teams. They'll let doesn't us matter. In. They'll let doesn't us matter. in. Doesn't matter. Ah, let no, us no, in. they won't. They haven't, decide, they haven't decided yet whether letting Canada, um, Mexico, United States, that all three are getting in in 2026. That hasn't been decided. Now, I know the South Americans have four. Um, but, but, you know, again, this bid going to the market with five is saying, hey, everyone in the world, <laughs> vote for us. But by the way, hey, Oceana or whoever, there'll be one, you know, yeah, okay. one of you won't be going. So, like, this this is one of the issues, that, another issue they're going to face with the okay, bid. It's, it's, okay. it's, 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 it's pretty unlikely. Not, not impossible, because let's be honest, there's right and there's wrong and there's how you do a FIFA bid. I mean, I, like, I, I, but I'm just saying, like, you're looking for Boris to succeed where Beckham didn't. On some of this stuff, you know, maybe Boris, maybe they needed Boris rather than well, Beckham the last time round. Is, 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 is Boris not far more suited to this type of a job? Do you know what? Maybe he is. Maybe I'll take that back. Maybe this is that's where it went wrong before. But like, like this is this is another issue that we face with this. Um, but again, the, the, the people have been slow to clarify this point. They, this, this didn't make it into the uh, the briefing to the, the political world about actually Ireland might not be actually be in this right, thing okay. that hasn't been clarified. Yeah. Now, the one thing I would say, because again, this story has been knocking around for so long, and I should say, there was this, unless, I, again, it's possible that I, I've slept through the last couple of years and I've missed all of this happening, and there's a terrible confusion, I've dreamt some of this, but there was a story at one stage that as part of the bidding process, there was a chat about maybe Croke Park for the opening game. A few people were were sort of tossing this around as a, as a discussion point that maybe if they could get Croke Park in it, part of the carrot would be it could have the opening game. And there would be a prestige with that, I guess, you know, with the World Cup starting here. Um, and, and that has definitely been discussed before, but which is, again just speaks to the point that this has been going on for ages. Yeah. Um, and as just happened, and that actually is, you know, you, can, you, you could actually probably sell that angle, but I'm not sure where that aspect of it actually where that stands at the moment. Um, so what are, you, what, what, are you, what are you saying to me then, if we take away all the, as I said, nauseating PR that will go with it, do you think this is a, a, a suitable way for Irish sport to spend its money? Like Nathan made the point oh, sorry, at the start yeah. of the show that really this should, this should come out of the tourism budget. This should, come out, this should not come out of any money which could go to grassroots sports. I thought that was a very fair uh, suggestion. Like, I'm, I'm, I really, should it, should it detract from sporting facilities around the country? I don't think it should. But, you know, money is going to come from somewhere. Uh, so if it comes from tourism, that might affect the sporting budget. Either way, it'll be a serious amount of money spent. Is it worth it is kind of a question. Yeah, I, I think it, I, I, I'm not so sure that it is, yeah. really. You know, um, like it's not as if it's like, you know, in the political world where you get no votes and you get your, you know, your entry fee back or something. Like, you know, if you, if you go through with this bid, which I still haven't decided to do, you know, if you decide to go through with it, and, I, and to be fair, I think at a UEFA level, they'll find out whether it's worth going through with it or not. They'll, they'll sort of, you know, it'll be laid down where they're going. You know, it's it's a spend to go through with it. Um, and like my point is, like, you know, you you know, you're you're doing well to get functioning Wi-Fi in, in sort of grounds in, in our country here, you know, and yet we're talking about a World Cup bid in 2030. Like at the moment, you know, there's grassroots fo footballers up and down the country who don't know when they're going to play again, and yet they're seeing stuff in the news about bidding for a 2030 World Cup. It just, it's 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 
it's in con you know it's in Congress in a way. Like I, I, I understand. Listen, I, to some degree, I think they've been at, like and at the FBI initially were asked into this. I think the, the a lot of the heavy lifting is going to be done by the English FA in many respects. Yeah. And I think that the the, the the Irish wing is just going to be a wing of it. And, that, and that's almost my point. It would be a small part of the tournament, not this Cork Limerick around the country sort of crap that people are going on about, right? Like it would be a small part of the tournament and a bit like the Euro 2020 where we have a wing of games and there's an element of pot luck about what you get mm. if Ireland aren't in it. Mm. And will we, will we look at that in 2030 and go, if Ireland got through all of this, which is a massive if, you know, could, what was it worth it? I mean, listen, maybe people say we're being utterly cantankerous here. We're being Grinches, you know, sorry, World Cup you, of Ireland. You, well, okay, I'm, me, okay, I'm, so you. You're, I mean, you're all on board the express. Sorry, so, I don't know. I, well, I don't know what I think. But I'm you, just. You'll be, you'll, be introdu you'll be introducing the fans to a fan zone of some description. Well, look, if there's corporate tournament. work in it for me, then I think we <laughs> yeah, should discuss this, it a bit more. <laughs> I can see you doing that. But like the point is that, like maybe we should go listen once in a lifetime chance to say we have the World Cup mm. here. But I, I, I always have the view with these big tournaments bids, and I was the same at Euro 2020. I'd love it to be the culmination of a process where people can come to our country for this tournament and say yes. Come to Ireland. This is a modern football nation. Look what we've done with our stadiums here. Look what we've done, and this is a culmination of our of our work. Rather than we have what we have, uh, the foundations here are still very shaky, or in some places don't exist. Yeah. And let's put a big trophy tournament on top of it. But like that, that my whole point is that that trophy tournament, that let's get out there, is like completely indicative of the of the political class's relationship with Irish sport. Mm. It's very much about, this is Charlie Haughty waiting for, for Stephen Roach. You know, this is about being front and centre, you know, in 1994 when, when people are coming down O'Connell Street or whatever, but then sort of not really been anywhere to, to be seen when aspects of the game here are like dying, you know, and, and infrastructure is non-existent. Mm. But hang on, there's a tournament bid. Well, listen, get me out there, show me the cameras. Let's talk about this because this would be great for the football family and for the nation. If you want to do something that's properly great for the football family, I think it's about building something from the bottom up, supporting that, and then it would be brilliant in 15, 20 years if we could have a tournament here and people could say, yeah, this is a country that gets its business done in football. But that's not the case at the moment. Yeah. So I guess I'm coming down with no. That would be my conclusion on that one. That is very fair. We'll take a short break. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Only the cream of the crop pick up Champions League medals. Jonathan Greening's got one. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Show me the science with Professor Luke O'Neill. A News Talk original podcast series focusing on different issues from the serious to the silly. All explained through science. Catch up on the podcast series at Newstalk.com or on the Newstalk app. Get ready for the Cheltenham Festival with the Boyle Sports app, with markets available on every festival race, plus free live streaming on all UK and Irish horse races. The Boyle Sports app has got you covered. Need to study up? Check out our Racing Post insights or watch our exclusive video previews with Cheltenham Gold Cup winning jockey Robbie Power. The Cheltenham Festival on the faster than ever Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. Get the power to do more with Sky Broadband and our best ever Wi-Fi from just €35 Euro a month for 12 months. With lightning fast speeds, you can stream the hottest new shows without your screen freezing. And gamers can leave buffering broadband for dust. Switch to Sky Broadband from just €35 Euro a month for 12 months. Search Sky35 today. Availability subject to location from 500 megabit speeds. Set up fees minimum term and further terms apply. See sky.ie forward slash speeds. Why have thousands of Irish businesses already signed up for the Advantage card from OnPost Commerce? Well, it gives you a massive 34% off standard parcel labels and discounted stamps too, helping you cut your delivery costs. So make sure your business is taking full advantage of these fantastic savings. Get yours free today at your local post office or visit onpost.com slash advantage card. OnPost Commerce for your world. Terms and conditions apply. Offer ends April 30th. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power Only the cream of the crop pick up Champions League medals Jonathan Greening's got one Gamble responsibly, gamblingcare.ie Now you're very welcome back Myself and Dan McDonnell here with you Let's check in for the latest at the Etihad 
Man City 1, Wolves 1, Connor Cody's 61st minute goal has given this game a different complexion about it. Now it's City's turn to look uncomfortable and mistakes are creeping into their game. Wolves can smell blood and they've started to spring attacks on the counter. Triore and Neto's pace, it's causing problems for City's defence and they've come close with a few efforts on goal. City could be in danger of losing this, which in the first half was unthinkable. It's Man City 1, Wolves 1 at the Etihad. Yeah, interesting. Adam Jury there at the Etihad. Now we wanted to mark the passing of in St. John, he's passed away at the age of 82. Randley described as an iconic figure in Liverpool's history and paid tribute. Very happy to say Mark Lawrence is with us. Evening. Hi, Joe. I had a look back a couple of years ago. You were listing off the 10 most influential uh, players at Liverpool and in St. John made your list, so you held them in extremely high regard. Christ, I can't even remember doing it, Joe. Um, yeah, well, I think, I think, so obviously, Shankly, once Shankly got there, and then he started to build his team, um, and he and he bought Saint, didn't he? But uh, wasn't that the story with it? With the I think it was thirty-five grand, and the board said we haven't got thirty-five grand. He said, well, you'll need to find it because we're taking him. Mm. And I think so. And then they bought uh, Big Rod, Ronnie Yates. So I was talking to someone today about it all, and I, and I said, you know what? I said it, it's a bit. Those two players going there with Shankly are, was a bit like Allison and Van Dijk going with Klopp, almost not final, final pieces of the jigsaw, but certainly the, the, the boost and the kick to give the rest of the players in the squad that extra uh, kind of kick on and, you know, and, and were obviously quality players. I mean, Saint, Saint was, um, he was only five foot eight. And if you think about it, he, play, he played in a little bit off Roger Hunt. I mean, Roger Hunt just scored goals for fun, didn't he? And that, um, I think Peter Thompson on the left, uh, left wing, in Callan on the right. But but Saint was a Saint would scrap with anybody. He was just that's the that's the way that he was. And for for a, a relatively small fella, um, he was really really fiery. But he was also a very very good player and a, and a good a good team man as well. Mm. 118 goals and 425 appearances. So mm. he arrived. Uh, at Anfield in May 1961, as you said, for the £35,000 record signing then at that stage. So I make it around then, you're about four years of age. So do you remember him playing? Were you watching him? No. I can. I, I, I tell you what I can remember. The first thing I can remember was the cup final against Leeds when he scored with the diving header. Was that 65? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how I know that, Joe? Go on. Because the year before, Preston win the final against West Ham. Mm. <laughs> so that <laughs> that kind of kick started the fact. Ah, it was the year after North End. We're unlucky after twice being in front. Yeah, and he won two league titles, as you said, that goal and the FA Cup final as well. Mm. Um, and a, and a good teammate, you say. You, you, so you're talking to a few people who who obviously were around him today. Yeah, well, no, I think he was, I think he was a fab teammate, and I think. Um, I think both himself and, and Big Ronnie Yates, because they were, they were massive buddies, that they stood up to Shanks. You know, if they, if they disagreed with something that Shanks had said or done, they, they stood up to him. Um, and I think they were a very, very strong dressing room. And I know football was extremely different in the, in the 60s, and you can only talk about your time when you actually played. But they, they, they ran the dressing room, and there were, there were never, ever, ever any problems, I was told. Uh, that Shankly had to come in and sort out because the players sorted out between them. And the majority of the time, it, it was the Saints and, and, and big Ron Yates as well. Mm. I was reading, it jumped out to me, I was amazed to see this. He, um, it was on the BBC website. He won 21 Scotland caps. A meagre mm. amount, a meagre amount, they say, for a player of such talent. But it was a fate that befell many of the so-called Anglos who were out of sight, out of mind to those in charge well, of Scotland at the time. Yeah, well, I, well, I, I mean, Hanson and Dalglish had it. I mean, um, it, it got to such a thing with, with Alan, with, with Big Al Hanson, that he, he wasn't that bothered about going to play for Scotland because he got so much abuse. Mm. Um, Ken, Kenny was different, obviously, because Kenny um, was, was a genius north and south of the border, but Big, Big Al was like, oh, Christ, it's uh, international week next week. But, yeah, they were, all, they were all like it, and I think the kind of feeling generally in Scotland was once you crossed that border to go and play in England, it was like, no, see you later. So, yeah, there was, I think there's quite a few of them sort of suffered with the go around, take the money down south, but come back to play for Scotland, no thanks. Mm. Dan, do you remember Saint and Greavesy? Yeah. I do. 
sorry, no, I, I do. Sorry, sorry, no, because I think I know I you think, do, Mark. <laughs> I, I think, I think, I think the point here, Mark, is that that Joe doesn't because he's just got that bit of a, a couple of years youth there, and he and he doesn't remember them. And I, I don't want to misquote you, Joe, but no, for I don't. me, no. for but, but for me, sort of uh, growing up in the eighties when football on TV was like a treat rather than like saturation, like Saint and Greaves, he was like. You know, in the same way, it was a sort of it was related to like the ITV Sunday afternoon match being the only live football that you would see on TV. And Saint and Greavesy were like, you know, inextricably linked with the, the coverage and the chat and and the sort of discussion around football. So it's an it's an early memory for me, um, and I'm sure there's probably people listening who you know who are maybe a couple of years older would have much more clear memories. But yeah, very much so. And like I, I was actually going to ask, um, you know, Laurel, like. Like you, you look at sort of the modern player now and how they all sort of love Neville and Carragher. And I know Saint and Greavesy was more light-hearted, and but like mm. I'm guessing there wasn't that much football on the TV. I'm guessing it was a show you possibly probably all watched as players, and you were following following it on a regular basis. Well, we 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 would because if you think about it, also everybody played on Saturday at three o'clock. So that their their show came on about twelveish. I think obviously the BBC still had they had football focus on the other side. But but Saint and Greasy came on about twelve o'clock. I think they probably went in direct opposition to uh, to football focus, and they were they were different and they were funny. Um, they were still obviously quite serious about the football, but it was just always a really good watch, and you'd be having a bit of a laugh and stuff. But I think. And I, and I don't mean this in, a, in any kind of strange way, but we were all very much captive audiences because generally we, as, a, as teams, we ate at 12 o'clock before 3 o'clock mm. and we ate steak, which was nuts when you think about it, but mm. everyone thought it was a good idea. So literally you'd wolf, you'd wolf your meal down straight away and then you'd go in the TV room if you're at a hotel because you're playing away from home to watch Saint and Greavesy. And so was it akin to Football Focus? Like they were talking about the serious issues of the day. It wasn't just messing around. Not really. Okay. No, they, they didn't really do serious issues, Joe. They just, they, they were just generally light-hearted. It was where Saint came up with it. it you know, it, it's uh, where it, Greavesy came up with it. It's only a game, Saint, in it, and all those kind of okay. things. But it, but it was, it was, it was light-hearted and it, and it was fun. Yeah. I think you take a nod from that into your approach, don't you? Well, it's not life or death, is it? No. So, you know, it is what it is. Although, although I'm, my name now seems... I'm got, I've lost Laurel. I'll come on as Victor. As in Metal Drew. <laughs> <laughs> See, you laughing. Everyone laughs when I tell them. And you obviously think, yeah, you're right. I've, 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 no idea. <laughs> I've no idea how they came up with that. Right, whatever. Hey, listen, a bit of dry wit is a badly missed thing on TV. Don't ever change. Right, and you open your mouth sometimes, aren't you? <laughs> so, uh, look, I mean, condolences to all concerned. It's very sad. Yeah. 82 years of age and huge figure in Liverpool's history. I suspect they'll mark it uh, this week. They play Chelsea. Um, somebody, uh, one of the lads outside, would just sent me on the list of Liverpool injuries this year and, and said it'd be interesting to get your take on it. So mm. it's, it's staggering when you see this. So let me just give you an abbreviated version. This isn't even everything. Alison, this is all before Christmas, for instance. Alison with the thigh injury, Milner hamstring, Keita hamstring, Henderson hamstring, Shakiri had a muscular injury, Joe Gomez, the tendon rupture, Trent had a calf strain, Fabio Tavares hamstring, uh, Keita again, muscular injury, Joe Matip, muscular injury, Van Dyke, obviously that was a freak incident, uh, Thiago, knee, uh, Alison again, a shoulder injury, Henderson again, a uh, quad strain, Joe Gomez again, knee injury after Christmas, Jota muscle injury and Henderson again, hip injury. So it's, it's an unbelievable list. It is leading the sports scientists out there, the amateurs, to wonder if, you know, well, one, the team on the road a long time, but two, Klopp, Gegen pressing, Dortmund, there was a big fall off. Is something happening here? Uh, Man City, it seems, tailored their training pre-season to allow for the fact they didn't have a proper pre-season and they're, they're coming good now. Not that they haven't had injuries themselves, but that list does catch the eye, doesn't it? Whatever's going on. Is there much talk about that around the club? Uh, not, not greatly. I, I think, I mean, the, the City thing, because they were, they were ninth for a few weeks, weren't they, at the start of the season? Yeah. So obviously they were, they were very slow to get up to speed. 
Um, and of course, Klopp would demand that you know first game of the season they have to be at, at, at full speed. But I think as well because there, there wasn't much of a, a break in between uh, the two seasons, the way they train. I mean, pre-season um, he does three sessions a day, Jurgen Klopp. Now it's worked for two or three years, but obviously this, this season it's been a, a particular problem. But I think this this happens um, always. I remember certainly one year. At Liverpool, where um, I tore me, I tore me Achilles. Uh, no, I kept, no, it wasn't that. I kept dislocating my shoulder. I think three times did it. I think Kevin McDonald had a really, really bad broken leg. Jim Jim Beglin yeah. broke his leg really, really bad. And we just had one of those years. We never, we never changed the way that we trained ever. Now you might say those days are mine to do with the pitches. It might be do this and that and the other. But broken legs certainly aren't. So. I think it, it is very, very intense. But he, he's Klopp's people will have will have looked at all the data. They put these these kind of waistcoat things on, don't they? And they know exactly who's running and how far and all those kind of things. So they, they'll they'll have done all that. But I just think they've been seriously unlucky, and mm. it happens. No, you know, it, it does. Just, it does, yeah. I look. I mean, it's it's. Uh, they have the best people working there. It's just one of these freak things. But they've had seventeen injuries to Spurs is twelve, Man City twelve. Chelsea Leicester? eight, United seven. So seventeen for Liverpool. What about Leicester? Leicester up to six now. They've all they've. I'm, I'm, oh, quest, I'm questioning that six. They've had more than six, haven't they? I think they've no, had they've six had more now. Than, I, yeah. I think I think they're in double figures. Yeah, I took a screen grab the other day. I, I think even at the moment they have Fafana, Justin, Madison, Pratt, Perez, Morgan, Barnes, Evans. So they've at least at, at least eight on the go anyway. Yeah. So and I bet I bet I bet they've not done anything different. Mm. No, it's difficult um, to know. Although although they've got a new training ground with a golf course in it, so that'll probably get the blame. <laughs> I've been told to go over to the Etihad. Adam Jury is there. Man City 2, Wolves 1 and Gabriel Jesus has put City back in front and at a critical time too. It came about when the ball was passed down onto the right hand side. Kyle Walker burst first forward, crossed into the box. The Wolves defence didn't deal with it properly. It fell to Gabriel Jesus six yards out. All he had to do was poke it in and he made no mistake. Man City 2, Wolves 1. There we go. No real surprise. That will be Mark Lawrence in 21 matches and counting when they see this one. Brilliant. I'm, I'm absolutely brilliant, and I think the the biggest thing is is the two centre backs mm. just absolutely totally made all the difference to that team. And they're both obviously you know football playing centre backs, but they've got conceded any goals. Hardly the goalkeeper never gets too much praise, but uh, he's he's had an outstanding season. So uh, they'll they win the they'll win the league by probably second week in. April, if not first. It's looking that way. As a defender, had you looked at Stones and given up on him? Yeah, I had a little. I had a little bit because I know I know a lot about Stones because I remember when uh, Moisey took him from. I think he was at Barnsley, wasn't he? And I, and I'm pretty. And he was, I think he was playing right back. He's either Barnsley or Rotherham. And he took him it's to Barnsley, Everton. Yeah. Yeah. Barnsley. And everybody had looked at him. Joe, it's one of those, you get you get a really good player in the championship and everybody goes and looks and they kind of make him the thing, can, can he play in the Premier League? What if Thierry Henry runs at him and all that kind of stuff? And um, and I think because everybody looked and thought, not sure. And in the end, Mr. Not Sure himself took him. And he said straight away, he said, oh, he said he's, he's, he's going to be a centre-back. He said, because he's, he's excellent on the ball, he's... he's Recovery is really, really good, and we just need to teach teach him in the proper art of defending. And mm. um, it's a difficult one because did he go to City for fifty mil? Yeah, about that. About that. And I mean, sometimes you know that 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 can turn your head, and also you know you walk into a dressing room that's full of massive stars, where you've gone from Everton, where they're not massive stars, they're some very, very good players, but it's not the same. And you've got this fifty million pound price tag on your head. And you feel you've got to do something um, just to sort of say to people, oh, you know, that's why I'm 50 million because I'm a really, really good player. And I think he made a few mistakes, suffered a bit, you know, lacks of concentration, and completely lost his confidence. Mm. Um, and you know, he's, he's always been a really, really good footballer, but now he just actually defends properly. Yeah, it's nice to see him back. It would have been a real waste mm. Uh, mm. for Liverpool this year, I guess. 
finishing fourth Top four. is about it yeah. and, and, and get this season behind them, forget about it and, and reconvene and feel good about life with a fresh season. That's the aim, really, isn't it? Yeah, well, because, I mean, especially especially with the pandemic in, ret in return of, of no, of no um, supporters, um, they have lost a lot of money. And obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's about the revenue stream as well. So to get back in the Champions League, um, you know, then I'm not sure if, who or when, why they'll, they'll buy players in the, in the summer. I would have thought that they will. But it might make the difference if, if they're actually in the Champions League. Well, it will make the difference if they're in the Champions League. And what I would say about the American owners is, is that, um, you know, I think when Klopp's gone to them, when he's gone now, look, you know, as in um, when he really needed a goalkeeper after the Champions League final, and he went, look, and he's 70-odd million, whatever it was, and they went, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting. No, it's, it's, it's one of them, and it just get, get to fourth or better and get out of town. Yeah. Um, get, get yourselves a holiday and come back next season ready. Yeah, well, they have Chelsea on Thursday, I think, so... Mm. We'll see how they go. Marco, it was great to have you on. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Cheers. Mark Lawrence and there, uh, paying tribute to Ian St. John. That was um, initially certainly the reason he was on. So Jonathan Wilson writing today saying Ian St. John was a gifted broadcaster, uh, the perfect straight man for Jimmy Greaves. I really do feel, Dan, I've missed out on something with that show. It's, yeah. It, it, because it was only on for about six, seven years, and yet for a, a generation talk about it as if it was like match of the day on for decades. It was like this huge thing. I kind of... I wish I'd seen yeah. it at the time. I, I think it's probably because uh, was a lot of people are the age that remember it yeah. are probably sort of, you know, uh, the, the youngest ones would be sort of late thirties, early forties, you know, and it's sort of that's that's you know a lot of people are now at a stage where they're older, looking back and reflecting on their time. And as I said, like I remember it ish, like you know, I remember Greavesy being a sort of a jokey character, mm. you know, and I recall watching it because there was so little to watch. I actually forgotten that I went head to head with football focus. I wasn't. It almost felt like it was one of the few things that was on. I didn't think it was a clash, but but maybe there was, but. But but certainly it was definitely a very different style of football coverage, like more so of the era, mm. you know, the more lighthearted. I know I sort of mentioned Neville and Carragher there, but it couldn't be any more different. Like it was, it was more sort of jovial and less serious. And and but I guess I was more so saying though it was of the day. You know, I'm sure you know people just talked to it to just see what Saint Agresi said because they didn't have much more reference point for their pundits, mm. if you know what I mean, mm. in terms of. Well, you know, the match had a rotating one. And, of course, Match of the Day was, a, was an institution in its own way. But I think, like, the rights went, you know, BBC didn't have rights for a period of time and stuff as well. So in that sort of late 80s, early 90s, things were sort of uh, flittering around a bit. OK. Football on Off the Ball is with thanks to Paddy Power for information on responsible gambling. Visit gamblingcare.ie. Back in one sec. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power The Champions League We love it as much as Neymar loves himself Gamble responsibly Gamblingcare.ie To keep well over the days and weeks ahead It's good to make a plan Keeping in contact with friends and family Could be part of it And in these times A good catch up over the phone Can do a power of good Make your plan today to keep well Find more ideas at gov.ie forward slash Healthy Ireland. Get ready for the Cheltenham Festival with the Boyle Sports app. With markets available on every festival race, plus free live streaming on all UK and Irish horse races, the Boyle Sports app has got you covered. Need to study up? Check out our Racing Post insights or watch our exclusive video previews with Cheltenham Gold Cup winning jockey Robbie Power. The Cheltenham Festival on the faster than ever Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. Let's see. Avocados, bread. What else do we need? Patrick, have you ever thought about wearing a fireman's uniform? A what? You know, yellow helmet, fire retardant jacket, a sprinkling of i Uh, why are we talking about this in the vegetable aisle? How about a teacher? Guard a traffic corps. Sorry? Deputy planning regulator? At ICS Mortgages, we've got a mortgage designed specifically for public sector employees. It's a mortgage offer so good, everyone wants in on the action. To find out more, contact your local mortgage broker, call us on 1890 427 427 or visit icsmortgages.ie. Lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. Dilosk DAC, trading as Dilosk and ICS Mortgages, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Champions League nights on Off The Ball. Bigger than Zlatan's eco. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Let's go back to Adam Jury at the Etihad. 
Man City 3, Wolves 1. Riyad Mahrez has wrapped this game up as a contest deep into stoppage time. It was actually Wolves who couldn't quite get the ball out of their penalty area. They turned the ball over to Man City. Sterling couldn't quite control it, but his missed touch fell to Riyad Mahrez inside the box, and he struck the ball hard with his left foot into the bottom left corner of the net. Man City 3, Wolves 1. Now, as B, we uh, begin to round up the show for this evening, should remind you from next Thursday, Golf Weekly is moving to Patreon. If you sign up, you get a bunch of uh, rewards, extra episodes, content around majors, uh, loads of big-name interviews with some big names in golf, hopefully, and uh, plenty more besides. otbsports.com forward slash Golf Weekly is where you can find out all the details, Three ninety nine plus VAT per month, or just search Golf Weekly on patreon.com, and that page is live as we speak. So come join us from next Thursday. As I speak, Man City have scored a fourth, a fourth. So let's hear about that. Man City four, Wolves one, and Gabriel Jesus has made absolutely certain as a result, and it's actually given the score a little bit of an embarrassing feel for Wolves. It was Ilkay Gundogan who struck from outside the box. Rui Patricio couldn't handle the heat of the power of the shot. It came about to Gabriel Jesus. He poked in from close range. Man City four, Wolves one. There we are, 21 games and counting for Man City. If you're uh, just tuning in as well, we touched on the latest in the Gordon Elliott situation available for a podcast in all the usual places. We had Colin Keyes on. We heard from Luca Allen, a young Irish driver making big waves in motor racing. And Dan McDonnell is still with us as we said goodbye on the football show earlier on. Uh, if I was to sum up his general sense, uh, pretty encouraged by the, the brand <laughs> new announcement today, the new announcement uh, ahead of the World Cup 30, 2030. Sees only good things and, you know, things, some of the cynics out there might want to give this thing a chance, Dan. I'm, I'm, pretty, st pretty I'm, much... still, I'm, I'm still reeling from the breaking news, Joe. Uh, have you heard that we might be going in on the 2030 <laughs> World Cup bit? Um, I look forward to uh, all we need to complete the day now is a Healy Ray to talk about it and listen the night is young <laughs> it's so young the it's night so is young. so young it is so young uh, in truth Dan was making the point this feasibility situation has been ongoing since 2018 Theresa May backed this thing so uh, today was a rather strange PR uh, job I think is the general version Dan will say good night night Joe thanks a million OTBAM uh, live tomorrow as usual from half past seven in all the usual places, social channels, OTB Sports Radio, the Go Loud app as well, the OTB Sports app, which you should download if you haven't yet. Uh, Louise Galvin will be talking uh, rugby, John Duggan with the latest on the Elliott fallout, Daniel Harris ahead of Manchester United Crystal Palace this week. And then tomorrow night, amongst other things, we will have Wednesday night rugby. We have Keith Wood on as usual, and we have roped in Stuart Barnes. So always a really interesting outside voice in Irish rugby. So Stuart Barnes and Keith Wood, amongst other things, tomorrow night. Tom Dunn is on the way next.